Okay, so if you watch the first bonus lecture, we talked a little bit about color and some of the issues with color. And now I'm going to go through some slides a little bit quickly. I'm going to upload them so you can have them as reference uh, to provide some more information about um, JPEG encoding and how it works with color uh, if you're interested in that topic. And also some of the details about what's going on that we kind of slid over. Um, these were created for uh, another course, and so, um, but rather than recreate a whole new set of slides, I'll just upload them as they are and explain some things as we go along. So the basic steps in image compression, as we've discussed, uh, we want to do something so that we can get rid of uh, redundant information. And so the first step we want to do is reduce the correlation between pixels. We don't want to send the same information over and over. And then we're going to do quantization, or in other words, approximate. So it's a lot easier to send the number 2 than it is to send the number 2.13597642.8. And so quantization is getting rid of some information in a way so that it's easier to send uh, what remains. And then finally, we have source coding. And source coding... Um, is used to reduce and take advantage of, of what redundancy information might be left uh, after we've done things. Okay, so how do we evaluate our performance? Well, one is the root mean square. We just take our uh, original image, which in this equation is f of x comma y, minus our uh, processed image, f uh, prime, x comma y, uh, sum over the square, and we divide by uh, the total number of pixels, which is the width times the height. Take the square root, and that's our root mean square to error. Uh, peak signal to noise ratio essentially uses um, the RMSC, the, uh, or rather the mean square to error, and um, normalizes it by 255. So 255 would be the peak value that a uh, image sample could take on using standard 8-bit images and so this is a common PSNR is a very common way to do this. Another thing that we talk about is the compression ratio where it's the data rate of the original image divided by the data rate of the encoded bit stream. So if our encoded bit stream was half the size that means our compression ratio is 1 over 1 half or 2. Okay, so how do we reduce the correlation between the pixels? We've talked about this already with respect to the DCT by saying, hey, the DCT, or 8x8 uh, eight eight blocks of an image are mostly um, the same value, or pretty close. They're going to have a high DC component to them. And so uh, the DCT actually works pretty well at doing that. The maximal decorrelation process is called the Cahoon and the Web transform. And the problem with the KLT is that it is data dependent. You have to come up with new transform coefficients for any given data source. But it turns out that if you use as your data source a, a collection, a large collection of uh, natural images, the KLT actually looks a lot like the DCT. And so that's uh, one of the things in favor of using the DCT. There's also subband coding, uh, those are wavelet transforms, and predictive coding. Uh, the orthogonal transform coding tends to be the one that is uh, used to most places. It's used in JPEG, it's used in MPEG, and in other sources as well. But uh, the others still have their place. Okay. So uh, for the cosine transform, We've already discussed it in class, but here it is on a single slide. I'm just going to go past that slide, and we now see the basis functions. So um, we've already looked at the basis functions, and over on your right uh, is a picture I took of a uh, like the the roof beams of a, a temple in Korea that I thought was very interesting, and then I compressed it dramatically, and what you can see here. And this compression, this is different than the example that we 
we looked at before in the previous lecture where we just got rid of samples. Here we're actually using uh, the uh, JPEG. But I uh, reduced the uh, data rate so much that it had to scrap the color information. And the other thing that you see, and the reason I did this, is because like here where I just drew a red box, everything is solid. And so it's only using uh, the um, j equals zero, k equals zero, the first um, uh, coefficient of our DCT, just to represent the DC. But if you look right next to it, to the part that I just circled, we can see that it's not using the DC one anymore. What it looks like it's using is maybe um, alpha uh, 0 comma 1 or 1 comma 0. And so it's just choosing, it probably has a DC offset there as well, it needs that. But it's uh, otherwise it's just choosing a single coefficient. Look at these blocks over here. Um, once again, it's just choosing at most one uh, non-zero coefficient except for the DC. And so you can see the DCT coefficient or uh, basis function show up um, as tiles, you might say, to make up this, this image. Uh, and we've discussed already um, the zigzag pattern. The DC value is encoded separately in JPEG. And one of the reasons is there's a strong correlation between the DC coefficients in one block with the DC coefficient in another block. And so by uh, doing the DC uh, independently of the rest, you might have uh, an area of fairly constant illumination and all the DC values are pretty much the same. And so there's a lot of similarity there. And it turns out that we can take advantage of that. The so-called AC coefficients are encoded using the zigzag scan. Um, and that scan is represented by the numbers here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on and so forth, uh, to encode those oops, values. So uh, because the DC values are so similar uh, between adjacent blocks, what we really code is the difference between them. And that difference could be quite small. We want to encode that difference pretty accurately uh, because if you don't and you're off, you end up with blockiness in your image. But the differences will be very small values, so they will require fewer bits. So that's why we, we do that. Okay, so next what goes on is we do what's called run length encoding. So after we've um, uh, got our coefficient values and we've quantized them, uh, we do run length encoding. So this is the way this looks. It's a little bit um, strange, I think, looking at this. So I'll go through line by line. The first line shows the uh, values, the actual coefficient values. We have 57, 45, and then a string of zeros and a 23, 0, and so on and so forth. So oh, what do we do here? Now these values can be positive and negative. Uh, the positivity or the negativity of it doesn't really matter because we're dealing in a coefficient space. When we transform the entire block back to the um, spatial domain, um, we will end up with an all positive or a non-negative um, bunch of samples. So we have positive and negative values and we have a lot of zeros in here. Because we have a lot of zeros, run length encoding works really well. And the idea is every time we have a value, we put it with two values. Here we say 0 and 57. So what that means is that um, there are no zeros and then the value 57. And then we say 0, 45. So this doesn't appear to be compressing anything yet. And we say no zeros and then a value of 45. But suddenly we make up all our lost ground by saying then we have four zeros and a value of 23, 1, 0, minus 30, and uh, no zeros and minus 16, 2, and then a 1. And then we send an end of block marker. And that means 
that all the rest are zeros. So once we've got this, uh, and that's actually translated down below the end of block marker is zero, zero. Uh, this is all put out in binary and run through an entropy coder. Whoops. The entropy coder um, is a Huffman coder, uh, something we won't talk about much right now, but the basic idea is if there are patterns of bits that show up frequently, we use a very short, um, we substitute another pattern of bits that's short. And if there's a pattern of bits that shows up very infrequently, we use a very long code uh, for that one. And so by representing the common things with very few bits, you get more compression. So what about color? So the first thing we do in JPEG is we go from RGB to YCBCR. And we've talked about what goes on with the uh, luminance, uh, the Y component. Uh, but we also have the two chroma components, the CB and CR. And so we downsample that as we discussed last time, and then put the chroma components through the same type of compression as we did before. So it looks like this. We go to the YUV uh, color space, down sample the chrominance, and then we do our uh, DCT, the FDCT there uh, means forward, and then we quantize. But we have three quantizer tables. We have a quantizer table that we've already seen for the luminance, and then we have two others uh, for the color. And so we then uh, code uh, the colors uh, independently. So it's almost as if we're encoding three images. It's just that one of them has been downsampled, and or two of them have been downsampled. Those would be the color. And we use a different um, color quantization table. And that's shown right here, the QC. Uh, for the color components. So, uh, in general, uh, JPEG is robust and it works uh, well, and um, it's commonly used if at about one and a half to two bits per pixel. Uh, remember, we started with 24 bits per pixel, so this is a um, compression factor of um, about 12, 12 to 30, or 12 to 20. So uh, at that, the quality is indistinguishable from the original. If you go to a compression ratio of about 30 to 1, um, it's excellent. <clears throat> and if you come down to, say, um, a compression ratio of about 50 to 1, you have something that is probably good for most things, such as uh, web pages and things like that. So it, uh, it works really well. All right, that's it for the bonus lectures on color and JPEG.